When we think of printing, it makes sense to imagine the torque-driven rotary gears of the contemporary press punching out newspapers and magazines at colossal speeds. Power is the operative word, since humankind has understood since time immemorial that power lies in the ability to replicate and to reproduce. The history of printing is as vast a topic as there can be, tied as it is with our human development. This short video will attempt to survey that history and place it within context of the work being done at the McCodrum Library Book Arts Lab at Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada. The Book Arts Lab is designed to provide the experience of printing throughout the ages. It includes an iron press, two large and two small platen presses, a small and a large proofing press. It also possesses a large quantity of wood and metal type, typical of the letterpress era. Our ancient ancestors in prehistory experimented with the first printing, as exemplified by these handprints made on cave walls in Cuevas de la Manos on Rio Pinturas, near the town of Perito Marino in Santa Cruz province of modern Argentina. Here in the West, we think of Gutenberg in Mainz, Germany at the end of the Middle Ages as the progenitor of modern printing. Rather, printing began in earnest a thousand years prior in China. There, crafters would hew entire pages in reverse from a plank of wood, requiring as many carved boards as there were pages for the book. While the existence of a Chinese printing press is still being researched, at this time, printers burnished the form onto paper to achieve a print. It makes sense that they would work this way, since the Chinese character set is vast, ranging, on average, 50,000 different characters. It made the leap from woodcut to movable type almost impossible. Regardless, the Chinese experimented with movable types, first wooden, then ceramic, and created elaborate round carousels to house hundreds of individual pieces of type, known as sorts, that in a variety of combinations would make up the vast Chinese character set. For reasons that are still debated, printing never really caught on. However, these ideas traveled along the trade routes to Europe and eventually mingled with the mechanical ideas of the burgeoning Renaissance. Woodcut illustrations for hand-lettered books had been practiced since the 13th century. During the 15th century, several inventors and entrepreneurs experimented with printing presses of movable type, but credit has been given to Johann Gutenberg as the inventor of modern printing. His process involved movable type, cast in relief, which has endured for over 500 years. No one knows what Gutenberg's press might have looked like but likely it resembled the many presses illustrated in woodcuts made during the first century of printing, from 1450 onward. Based on a screw-powered wine press, early wooden presses were massive in size and operated with a flatbed upon which the type lay, which then slid under the platen screw press, the impression taken by pulling a hand lever. Early printers worked in tandem creating for themselves specialized roles such as pullers, typesetters, and inkers. The thin writing inks of the day proved unsuitable for printing, so Gutenberg also had to invent an ink thick enough to stick to the raised metal characters, but not so thick as to tear the paper when pulling it off the printed form. Presumably, he also had to adapt a method to apply the ink, likely using what are called ink balls, or wads of cotton rag wrapped in a portion of skived leather. Printers smeared ink on the pads, rolled them against each other to produce consistency, then rolled them onto the type. It took practice and skill to master fine printing in these circumstances. There are many examples, extant, of poorly inked work, which makes Gutenberg's Bible, the first book, all the more exceptional for its quality. To house his movable type, he created large trays, one for capitals or majuscules, and another for minuscules. These trays were arranged with the majuscules above and the minuscules below, hence the inception of uppercase letters and lowercase letters. Gutenberg is best known for his solution to the problem of creating movable type. As a goldsmith, he would have been familiar with casting techniques, and he perfected a way to cast type in lead, alloyed with tin and antimony, to harden it in a mold to create a perfectly formed length of lead capped with a letter in reverse, all of an equal height. Compositors set type in a composing stick, originally of wood, but in the later centuries metal sticks came into use. 
Here you can see the type laid into the stick, with spacers forming the blank spaces between the words, and lengths of lead creating white space between the lines. Not much changed in printing for about 300 years. By the mid-18th centuries, companies still founded lead type and still built presses from wood. In this 19th century idealization of medieval printing, we can see the force required to lever the press to produce a good impression. Failed attempts are represented by the crumpled pages beneath the press. Through the latter years of the 18th century, the nascent Industrial Revolution began to have an impact on the printing industry as literacy grew amongst the populations and demand for printed matter increased. By 1830, iron foundries began casting presses. The advantages over wood presses rested in the never-changing nature of iron. Iron did not swell or shrink with changes in humidity, which made fine printing easier. The cantilever innovation also made presses easier to use. Here is a demonstration of the proof being pulled off an iron press in the Book Arts Lab. This is a Washington style press. This one was manufactured by Arho and Company, probably circa 1850. It came from Canterbury High School in Ottawa and now will have a new role in the lab. If you watch carefully, you can see the unique double hinge mechanism that replaces the central screw, reducing the friction points and making the process more efficient. The large wood type on the press bed requires a lot of ink which is quite tacky. Peeling the proof off is like pulling off a band-aid. The paper is dampened to ensure a solid impression. If it's too damp, the paper can tear away and remain behind on the type. This is Carlton's massive Chandler and Price Platin Press. For years, students and staff knew it as a familiar site located in the library just before the elevators, or it is seen here near the entrance to Starbucks. The press came from the Pembroke Observer newspaper, then to a small press in the 1970s called Ladysmith Press in western Quebec. An English professor loaned it to the library in 1990 to commemorate the opening of a new wing. This press formed the keystone around which the library built its book arts lab. Now once again fully operational, the press is solely treadle-powered, making it something of a workout to run for any length of time. Both the platens at Carleton originally operated with motors, but these have been removed in favor of treadle operation only. Platen presses like this one evolved through the 19th century as a method to speed up production, particularly in smaller shops and regional newspapers. After three centuries of cranks and levers, engineers and machinists fabricated presses with gears and flywheels, which made them more efficient. Unlike the iron press, the type is locked in a chase, which can be carried away from the press, allowing another user to slide in the chase and begin their job without stopping to clean up or change anything, so long as a color change was not required. These platen presses could be motorized with ease, making the press move evenly, but also they could be sped up to go faster, which increased the risk of injury. The pressman had a narrow window of opportunity to retrieve the printed sheet and insert another blank sheet before the platen presses back down on the type, exerting enormous pressure. Being alert and rested is ideal, and keeping the back ramrod straight eliminates any danger of injury. The press operator gets the rhythm of the press and the motion back and forth becomes fluid. Unfortunately, in the era before safety standards, pressmen would work unbearably long hours, become exhausted and more prone to lose the beat, and get their hand caught in the platen as it closed. It is best practice to work on platens using hand or foot power, which gives the operator greater control. The principle that drives platen presses works at any size, making it ideal for miniaturization. These presses were made smaller for small businesses to print their own stationery, for private presses and the new phenomenon of hobby printing. Think early DIY. They were also portable, as seen here, with a 6x9 platen press situated in a gym bag, all ready to go. While presses got faster and bigger, sometimes filling entire warehouses and standing multiple stories high, demand continued for smaller presses for smaller applications. Bookwork, for example, could be done more effectively and with better quality on the older equipment. This encouraged the development of the small press and the private press movement. William Blake printed his books using etchings he created himself. 
A century later, William Morris founded the Kelmscott Press, using an iron press to produce books of exquisite quality, featuring types of his own design. His monumental Kelmscott Chaucer featured wood engravings designed by his friend, the Pre-Raphaelite painter, Sir Edward Burne Jones. Morris inspired T.J. Cobden Sanderson to found the Dove's Press. Cobden Sanderson was a fine bookbinder, totally absorbed in the philosophy and the aesthetic of the arts and crafts movement. And like Morris before him, designed the Dove's typeface especially for the press. Type designers became the forgotten artisans of the 20th century. They seldom received credit for their work, and typefaces were easily reproduced by any foundry. However, inside the printing industry, individuals became known for the quality of their work. Printers knew that every typeface had a human hand behind its creation. Here is a sample of Centaur, a typeface designed by Bruce Rogers in 1915 for a private press book titled with the same name. It is a revival of a classical Renaissance face from the Incunabula period, the first 50 years of printing between 1450 and 1500. Revival faces met resistance from modernism and Bauhaus influences in the 1920s. These new ideas impacted the design of the era, giving it a specific look and feel and influenced how we relate to visual communication today. Through the first half of the 20th century, small presses held on tenaciously to a foothold in culture, using smaller letterpress machines for their production. Virginia and Leonard Wolfe formed the Hogarth Press in 1917, during the Depression and after World War II, small presses formed a vital and influential portion of print culture. In the 1950s and 60s, hundreds of small presses rose up and sank back down again, always with more to replace them. A few would endure through the decades. Often these presses catered to radical or progressive writers and artists, like the group shown here in downtown Toronto in 1970. Coach House Press of Toronto, founded and helmed by Stan Bevington, Yet another is Gaspro Press, founded in the late 90s by Andrew Steves and Gary Dunfield, combining letterpress printing with offset to create unique award-winning books, both for their design and their content. Or Rob McLennan and Christine McNair of Ottawa, established poets who also publish their own works and others. Very simply, and in a cost-effective manner, these small Canadian presses are all different examples of publishers who print their product in-house. By 1980, the letterpress era had declined entirely, with presses and type pushed to the back of shops or out the door entirely, disposed of as scrap metal. Artists and designers who valued the technology for their own small-scale purposes rescued a lot of this material from landfill and put it back to use, printing limited edition, fine press books in the tradition of Morris and Cobden Sanderson, and as a method to print woodcuts and wood engravings. Here, artist and printer Alan Stein of Church Street Press prints on a Vandercook proofing press, very similar to the one now in operation in the Book Arts Lab. And this is the work of wood engraver Wesley Bates, who printed this illustration from a block he engraved by hand on a flatbed press. The letterpress printing scene today could not be more different than that of hundreds of years ago, as artists and designers have taken over the technology and made it their own, both in artistic and bespoke commercial applications, such as calling cards and invitations. There are arguably more women printers than men using letterpress now, since the machinery itself does not judge worth based on gender. This is just one example of the power of letterpress in the digital age. Mm -hmm.